Welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. We aim to bring you the best macro analysis to help you successfully invest in financial markets. For our latest analysis, visit macrohive.com. Another US inflation number, another shocker, with January's inflation numbers reaching the highest levels since the early 80s. Markets are now expecting the Fed to raise interest rates by 50 basis points at their next meeting in March. And this is something MacroHive's Dominique Dwarfico has been calling for for a while. Clients of MacroHive's professional service would have been getting her insight. So if you're interested in our higher octane research service, drop me an email at bilal at macrohive.com. The question, though, is whether the Fed can tame inflation. I write a piece on the drivers of inflation on our main site, where Prime members can get access to. Take a look at it, and it could change your perspective. Then on crypto, we wrote a piece on whether Bitcoin is the next Amazon and whether it can make you a billionaire. We also update our Ethereum views, where we look at macro and on-chain analytics to derive our view. And we've introduced a new easy-to-read DAL system to tell you whether we're bullish or not, depending on each of these factors. As a MacroHive Prime member, you can get access to all of these pieces, podcast transcripts, and our member Slack room, where you can interact with the MacroHive research team and other members all hours of the day. You can sign up to become a member by going to macrohive.com. Prime membership to MacroHive costs the same as a few weekly cappuccinos. So go to macrohive.com to sign up. And as I mentioned earlier, if you're professional or institutional investors, we have a more high octane product that features all of my, Dominique's, and our team's views, our model portfolio, trade ideas, machine learning models, and much, much more. Hit me up on Bloomberg or email me on bilal at macrohive.com to find out more. Now, on to this episode's guest, Tanya Reef. Tanya is founder and CIO of Sender Digital Assets. Prior to her cryptocurrency focus, she worked at top macro hedge funds, including Soros, Lorien Capital, Citadel, and Alphadine. She was profiled in the 50 Leading Women in Hedge Funds 2017 survey by the Hedge Fund Journal. Her career spans public policy, beginning at the IMF, and experience in the banking industry at Citigroup's economic and market analysis team. She holds a PhD in economics. On to my interview. So greetings, Tanya. It's great to have you on the podcast. I've been looking forward to this uh, for a while. We had to move this uh, around a few times, but finally, we've got this. Uh, got, I've got you on the show. Great. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, thanks, thanks for your interest and for inviting me to participate. Great. Well, before we kind of go into the, the meat of our topic, I always like to ask my guests their origin stories. You know, where did they go to university? Was it inevitable you'd end up in finance? And how did you end up where you are now in crypto? <laughs> yes. Well, actually, in my case, um, I think the way I grew up, where I grew up is very relevant to crypto um, because I actually grew up in Venezuela mm. and I lived through the implosion the economic implosion of a country that was oil rich in the 60s and 70s to really what is a country that went through starvation of its citizens and mass exodus today. Um, and of course, that was the result not only of fluctuations in the oil price, Venezuela is an oil exporter, but also of macro mismanagement. And I lived through the years where we did most of the adjustment, the macro adjustment at the time through inflation and currency crisis. <laughs> um, so I actually like to say that in Venezuela, every taxi driver is an effects trader <laughs> because we live through so many currency crises over the years um, that everybody has to be on top of what the currency movement is doing, um, uh, what the dollar is going to be the next day, uh, what the uh, government policy around the, the exchange rate is going to be. That's really been pivotal for that country because it really exports oil and imports everything else. Um, so as I grew up and I lived through all this currency crisis, I was always curious and interested on what was causing all this devastating uh, uh, turmoil to the citizens and to my family because uh, I was hit very immediately by this crisis. My parents uh, were both uh, university professors in a public university. So our income was based on a 
public wage that was decimated in real terms when we had inflation and depreciation. So we lived very viscerally, very, uh, uh, very dramatically in my family, these big crises where 50, 60, 70% of your real income is wiped out in a matter, in a matter of days or maybe a month. Um, in, as I was growing up, I actually didn't think of studying economics and studying uh, 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 a currency crisis. I actually studied architecture initially back home. Mm -hmm. So I graduated as an architect and I was working um, in, a, uh, in my last years of school and right after I graduated, graduated in low income areas in the country, helping them with technical assistance and microcredits and so on. And during this time, we had a major financial and currency crisis. And at this time I realized nobody cared if their houses were green or red or square or round or not. They didn't have what to eat. And my motivation for economics and currency crisis in particular really took over uh, uh, you know, my day-to-day -day, uh, reason for uh, uh, my curiosity, my reason for being and, uh, and you know, going back to the office to design a kitchen uh, was no longer that, uh, that exciting. Um, so, you know, very quickly, I uh, initially uh, was going to come to Harvard to a master's in urban planning and economic development, which they had at the time. And before uh, starting, I decided to take a principles of economics class at Columbia, uh, because my uh, uh, ex-boyfriend at the time uh, was in New York, so I thought this would be fun. And that was an amazing class. I learned so much. I enjoyed it immensely. I realized I loved economics, but I loved macro. And the, the master's degree that I had signed up for was actually about urban economics. So uh, toll roads and sewage systems and rent controls and things like that. And I thought, no, 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 no. I really want to understand macro inflation, currencies and all these things. And of course, by the way, the, the typical model that you learn when you are doing a principles of economics uh, a course uh, is, when you have a currency devaluation, that's actually good for growth, <laughs> you know, in your very basic 101, right? And I remember thinking, well, that just does not sound right. I went through tons of these devaluations and our growth outlook work <laughs> became worse and worse. And of course, I wanted to understand better, dig deeper, get the most, uh, more advanced courses and, and, and really uh, get to the bottom of it. So that was the motivation to uh, switch to economics. I ended up doing uh, all the undergraduate courses um, and eventually my PhD in international economics at Columbia. And my dissertation was on currency crisis. <laughs> um, so, so you so spent, that, between your architecture degree, your, your master's PhD, I mean, that's a lot of time in university. I can, I can see you're, you're definitely the daughter of uh, professors here. Uh, uh, <laughs> absolutely. I, well, I, I did, a, a, um, uh, of course, I had my undergraduate degree. So when I did the uh, undergraduate equivalents for economics, it was actually a faster, faster pace yeah. because I just needed to do the, the, uh, uh, what was relevant for the economic major, if you will. So I could do that in about a year, year and a half. And then I applied to the PhD and, uh, and got in, and then I just uh, did the PhD. But the PhD, of course, is a long degree. <laughs> so, uh, so yes, yeah, so I had a, a, an academic, academic stint in my, uh, in my life where I was uh, teaching courses, doing research, and doing all th that kind of stuff that, um, that, that you do as a, as a PhD uh, uh, candidate. And then when did you actually move into markets then? So you were teaching and then, then, then well, how did you make not that Not yet, not yet. Oh. <laughs> and I graduated before going into markets. I actually went to work for the International Monetary Fund. Um, and of course, you can imagine that it to me it was extremely exciting because this is the fund that was created to help countries with their balance of payments, which is, of course, uh, what is the underlying uh, uh, flow for the uh, currency dynamics. And, uh, and that was my passion. And moreover, I got to travel all over the world all over emerging markets. I got to go to Asia. I got to go to Africa. I went, of course, to Latin America as well. Um, and uh, it was a, a great experience. And I did that for about four years. And then we were in the Goldilocks years of the economy. Those years before the global financial crisis mm. where everybody had paid back their loans to the IMF. We had solved the, the world's problems. The private sector was booming. And the discussion at the time was, 
why is the IMF still relevant? We don't have any crisis anymore. Everybody has paid back, you know, maybe for low income countries, there was some lending there, you know, poverty alleviation kind of stuff. Uh, but really the big uh, balance of payments crisis were not happening anymore. And the IMF started um, shrinking and actually incentivizing some of its staff to leave. Um, I ended up uh, you know, leaving to city uh, in 2006 um, because again the private sector was booming and was doing great, and I thought you know this is going to be the exciting next step in the world, um, and so I went to city. But funnily enough, a lot of the people at that time left in the first quarter of 2008. <laughs> then of course. And you have the big global financial crisis by the third quarter of, uh, of 08 and everything that, you know, that followed afterwards. And then the IMF became relevant again. <laughs> and uh, and uh, a lot of uh, they actually started recruiting a bunch of people back and, uh, uh, and the like. But at this time, I was already at Citi. So I, I was at Citigroup uh, in the um, economic and market analysis team. Um, I spent there uh, a little over three years. Uh, it was a, a great experience. It was my first exposure uh, to markets, to the sell side and the buy side, and how to think about strategy, how to, be, how to translate my understanding of macro uh, and economics into actual trade of executable tradable uh, themes that, uh, that that our clients could benefit from. Um, and uh, and I stayed at City up until 2009. Of course, after 2008, 8, 9, uh, it was a tough, you know, very tough periods in the in the banking sector. And in 09, I was extremely uh, um, happy and lucky that I got an offer from uh, Soros Fund Management. Um, and that was how I ended up uh, going from the sell side to the buy side. Of course, uh, Soros, uh, uh, very well known as an FX trader um, and currencies uh, was my passion. So I was, uh, I was very happy to do that transition. Um, it was a great team. I enjoyed very much my time there. Um, and I was doing uh, emerging markets research and strategy uh, okay. when I first, um, uh, when I first uh, moved to Soros. Um, from then on, I really spent the last 12 years of my career in macro hedge funds. Um, I spent, uh, after Soros, I went to Larian Capital. Um, that's when I started to uh, manage my, uh, my first uh, book. And it was a currency only book. Um, and that was also a, a great experience. Uh, ben Smith, which is the CIO, is a fantastic trader, and I, uh, I really learned a lot from him. Um, after Larian, I ended up uh, moving to Citadel, uh, where I joined a group that was doing effects and rates. And after Citadel, I joined Alpha Dine Asset Management, which is also a macro effects and rates fund. Um, and this is really what I was doing up until last year when uh, I decided to take the leap and switch to the crypto world. And, um, and now I'm, uh, I'm in fund formation process to uh, launch my own uh, uh, crypto focused uh, uh, fund in um, the first quarter of this year. So hopefully very soon. <laughs> great. No, that's a great story. Um, great background there. I mean, just, just one or two questions come up. You know, one is when you made that transition from doing research at the fund to um, managing your own book, um, what was that transition like? You know, because obviously when you're providing research into the PM, that's one thing, but obviously having your own book is a different thing. How, how did you find that transition? Absolutely. I, I think uh, I think it is a hard transition, but I was fortunate that uh, uh, that the CIO uh, Ben Smith at uh, at Lorian was uh, uh, was was very instrumental in helping me transition. And, and really, I think um, you need to learn about uh, portfolio construction, about how to think about uh, your beta in the portfolio, <laughs> um, your uh, momentum, uh, uh, the the volatility, um, all these things that as a researcher when you're not managing a book you're not thinking about um so uh, the, the, i also think um you do this part so, a little bit of this when you're thinking of in, in strategy terms that i was doing at soros and i was doing somewhat at city as well uh, which is to think about the timing of a trade as well um, i think that is the hardest thing 
Um, I, uh, you could be right. You could get the analysis right, the call right, everything right, and still lose money if you are too early in a trade or too late, <laughs> um, or or too late to get out, etc. Right. So, uh, uh, so thinking about that, thinking about how to uh, how to size the trades appropriately, uh, thinking about when to stop out of trades, and you know and how to manage risk. Um, all that is uh, uh, is is the part of the of the transition. And I was just very lucky to have uh, some one on my side that I could uh, go to and I could discuss the book as, as we went along and um, it's uh, it's it's something that it was interesting for me to learn so I actually enjoyed very much the process of, of being able to put my ideas to work and learn how to how to do that yeah and then when you expanded your uh, asset classes from FX to rates and I guess global macro I mean what what, what was that that transition like um, it, that that is, a, I mean, when you learn a new asset class, you just have to learn a little bit of the idiosyncrasies of that asset class. You know how to think about those trades, how to think about those risks, and how to uh, think about the uh, the correlation and the margin of all of adding uh, this kind of risk in your portfolio. So it really again comes down to portfolio construction. I think the transition from research and strategy to to actually managing a book is a bigger change. Yeah. than adding a different asset class yeah. you know in 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 a man, in in managing uh, imagine a, a book especially i'm going to say especially uh, uh rates and effects because they're so interrelated yeah. had i yeah. just been adding say um you know equity that would be very different yeah. yeah or if i would started you know selling ball or doing some kind of but fx and rates are very interrelated very they're they're you know from a macro perspective they are they're really uh linked by the hip so uh so so you, you if you think about an fx trade you're thinking about rates and if you're thinking about rates you're thinking about effects so it's it's a pretty natural transition to think about both of them together yeah. And then obviously you, you had a very successful career on the macro side, you know, FX rates, you know, traditional finance or TradFi as, as people in crypto call it. Um, what, what made you, you know, decide to have this switch to crypto? That's, that's quite a, a big change. Yes, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, given my background and my interest in, in, in currencies, when crypto came uh, to the picture early on, it was something that caught my eye and, and it was of interest. It was yet too early for me to be able to uh, uh, tell if this was going to actually have legs and it was going to survive and it was something that I could do professionally. But it was certainly very interesting, especially because after the global financial crisis, we had so much liquidity injection by the big central banks of the world. And that actually did a couple of things um, between the QE and the liquidity. We had a dampening of rates all over the world, but we also have, for those of us that were looking at effects, all the financial account flows were completely dampening all the current account flows and all the fundamental flows. And it was really, you could have countries, I mean, for, for those of us that were looking at emerging markets around that time, and you know, you could have, for example, countries like Turkey that had an enormous current account deficit, you know, dwindling reserves. It was in the brink of a currency crisis. And then you had this huge liquidity injection and they would, you know, <laughs> come out victorious and survive a few more years and so on. So, so really uh, this was changing the landscape. Um, and we had, you know, big, you know, QE efforts in a lot of central banks around the world. And then we came to the, you know, last few years where we actually had negative rates um, uh, all around, all along, around the world. So when you have this new asset class, well, at this point, it wasn't an asset class; it was just Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, when Bitcoin comes along, and it has this digital scarcity, and it has this ability to transact without uh, a, a trustless ability to transact without a central, um, uh, uh, um, a centralized way uh, of verifying the transactions, but it's really a decentralized uh, system to verify the transactions, um, and it looked. Uh, uh, that it was going to be a game changer in the world at the time, but it was very nascent and it was not clear to me that it was going to survive. It was really just an experiment. And it was really in 2017, 18, when we had really this very uh, big uh, uh, crypto rally um, that I uh, began to think, well, maybe uh, there's tailwinds to this. 
and there's going to uh, be more and more interest that's going to make it uh, more liquid. Uh, it's uh, the blockchain is now longer, so it's safer. Um, the uh, uh, ability to uh, to have more um, um, institutionalized, um, uh, 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 more formalization of the uh, uh, of the ecosystems around it is is you know it's, it's going to come to play. So I began to look at it more as a serious asset class, something where I could diversify in and perhaps get involved uh, professionally. But I think it was yet uh, too early for me. I did look at some opportunities at the time, but I decided um, against this. Um, and then I remember following it very closely, thinking that this was going to um, change the world in an important way. And it was 2019, the IMF meetings in October 2019, and we had a round table where I was a panelist and we were discussing the future of the global monetary system and the future of the US dollar. And they had invited representatives from uh, top policymakers, top managers, um, uh, top academics, and we were all discussing this. And nobody, nobody, not one person mentioned crypto or Bitcoin. If anything, in the hallways, the only thing they were worried about at the time was the DM, the, the, the Facebook uh, uh, stablecoin, okay. uh, which is really an SDR and which that project actually, you know, pretty much uh, uh, died, died out, I believe. I mean, who knows, it may resurrect uh, after this call. But, um, but the point is uh, the, the actual cryptos, the actual blockchain technology, the decentralized public blockchain technology was not discussed at all. So I took it upon myself to uh, bring the topic, to put it on the table and to tell everybody I could that this I thought was something that's going to change things. And, and that's how a bunch of my, my colleagues in the TradFi world knew me as a, uh, you know, as a crypto advocate uh, uh, in our group. And then came 2020. And uh, in 2020, we had the pandemic and with it, a huge liquidity injection again. And that's when I thought, OK, this is it. With this big tailwind, this is going to be a huge support for, uh, uh, for the crypto asset class. And it's going to bring uh, a lot of institutional interest and the like. And I started to look at it uh, seriously. Now, before uh, taking the decision to do this on my own, I felt very comfortable with my calls in uh, macro, uh, with my understanding of uh, the role that crypto could play as a digital scarcity asset. In the case of Bitcoin, of course, the other cryptos are different um, in our macro environment. Um, and I felt comfortable with my risk managing skills, but I needed the technology leg. Um, I needed to feel as confident as I was on the macro and risk management side on the technology side, because you can't really, I believe, they'll deal in this space without really a profound, deep understanding of the crypto technology. And this is where I just get lucky because it turns out that my family, um, we have a bunch of really brilliant engineers. And one of them is my brother who has also been working as a developer for uh, more than 10 years. Um, so I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, look, I really like this asset class. I need you to look into it. Um, Tell me what you think, and together uh, let's uh, let's think about this, and you know, and help me understand uh, the gaps that I that I don't yet know, and um, and you know, and let's look at this together, at this opportunity together. And uh, he looked at it, and he became more bullish than I was. <laughs> he thought the technology was fantastic. Uh, we started taking courses. He taught me about it, and then um, by the time 2021 came along. We thought that together we could actually bring the best of the understanding of uh, technology, um, developer uh, experience, um, and uh, from my side, I hope uh, a very competent also understanding of risk management and macro. And so together we can bring uh, uh, the best of wor both worlds to really offer investors uh, a serious uh, vehicle to uh, get exposure to the crypto space. And, and what would you say, you know, for someone who has a, a traditional finance background, I mean, what, what is it about crypto that, um, uh, that they should, that, what's the biggest gap they'll have in the understanding if they, if they did want to fully go into investing in crypto? You know, yeah. Because I understand, you know, a traditional finance person will understand your market sentiment, you know, position sizing and all of that type of stuff. They should presumably understand that. But 
what 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 is the gap they'll have yeah yeah so so it is important to understand that crypto tokens are very different than any asset class that we have in our traditional finance so they have elements from different asset classes um, but they are different and most importantly there are thousands of them and they are different within themselves it's not the case that you you can say well i understand bitcoin and so now that i understand bitcoin i'm going to invest in uniswap because that's just bitcoin for defi that's not how it works they're all very different and you need to understand each of them separately, how the underlying protocol works and therefore how the underlying technology defines how you're gonna think about it, how you're gonna uh, think about valuation and how you're gonna think about how to trade it. Uh, so for example, uh, some people say, you know, they are like tech stocks. Well, they're not, they are not actual equity. Um, some people trade them as commodity. Well, some of them are actually, some of them are closer to stocks, by the way. Some of them are not, some of them are closer to commodities. But for example, um, you can say with some people that are thinking the quality side, they're like, well, we're going to, you know, price should be close to marginal cost. Why isn't that not the case? Well, not really, because uh, the uh, supply of these crypto tokens is not actually uh, related to the cost of production. In there, it works more like a network effect. Um, or uh, the supply, you can think of it as each token having, some people call it their own monetary policy, but really what it is, it's their own governance structure that determines the supply of the token, how much, how quickly it comes into the system, is it burned, is it injected, you know, so each token has its own monetary policy, if you want to call it like that, its own structure of supply, its own use of play, so even if in something like a smart contract platform, you're interested in um, developer activity in the platform as a sign of demand. Maybe that's not what you want to look at when you're thinking of Bitcoin, because maybe you think of Bitcoin more of a store of value token. Um, so each of these tokens is different. Um, you need to, you can't think of them just as a stock or just as commodity or just as currency. Different uh, uh, tokens have different elements of each of these, and you want to understand where, in which bucket do the, each of these fit in and how do you think about trading them according to the uh, fundamentals, if you will, uh, for, for each of use of play of, of each of these tokens. Um, okay. So I think, I think that's, that's a big difference, which is why when people from our traditional world, traditional macro world are involved in the crypto space, they need to really understand the technology very deeply to be able to make reasonable bets in the space. It's not enough to just look at, you know, sentiment and things like that. I mean, it could be for, for somebody, you know, doing it on Sunday mornings in their home, but to do it professionally, you want to really understand the technology underlying it. And by the way, I would also say some of the uh, technology guys that are also involved in the space, if they want to venture away from the uh, venture, uh, venture tokens and very early stage tokens that are really a bet on the technology of the one token you are getting locked up in, if you want to do a more diversified portfolio and, you know, manage a, a book that um, is uh, more involved in more of the liquid publicly traded tokens, then you also need to understand the macro side of things. Uh, because the macro, you know, the, at the end, the price of a token is an exchange rate. Uh, it's the price of the token relative to your fiat currency of choice. It could be the US dollar or the euro or whatever it is that you're trading. So you want to understand the macro drivers underlying that currency. I think, you know, we've seen some of the macro drivers play a very important role this year in the crypto space as well. So you need, I believe, to have a diversified, well-managed exposure to the space. You need both an understanding of the technology and understanding of macro and actually an understanding, of course, of of risk management. Okay, no, that's that's great. And maybe if we if we focus on one or two of the the big cryptos to understand how you formulate a view. So say say Bitcoin. How do you come up with a view on Bitcoin? Yeah. So I, I, again, the, the initially I uh, we classify the tokens on use of play. So to okay. me, Bitcoin 
yeah, fits in the store of value token. Um, I think it's actually a, a, a store value par excellence in the crypto space, uh, given the uh, uh, the length uh, the, of time that Bitcoin has been trading and it uh, hasn't been, uh, the blockchain itself hasn't been uh, hacked and, uh, um, and it has worked uh, really, uh, really well all these years. I would say it's probably the safest, most secure of the blockchains um, out there. Um, it has uh, digital scarcity built in the protocol. It's decentralized. And this is an important point. So let me just take a minute here to say, I often hear people say, it's about the blockchain technology, not about the token. So it's about the Bitcoin hmm. blockchain and not about Bitcoin. And I think that's the wrong way to think about it because we need to understand Bitcoin as an intrinsic, important, uh, really uh, the oil of the blockchain technology. This is what makes it work. And why is that the case? Because for a public decentralized blockchain, you need to compensate players to validate the transactions. And that is compensated through Bitcoin. That doesn't need to be the case in a private blockchain. So if you have a private blockchain, you could still have a blockchain, but the transactions can be verified by the centralized owner of that private blockchain. I like to tell people this is like the um, internet versus the intranet, right? So the internet is like a public blockchain. The intranet is like a private blockchain and that's centralized. So for a central player to verify its own transactions, they can do that. They don't need an incentive. But if we're going to have a public decentralized one, nobody's going to verify the transaction if you don't compensate them. So if you compensate people with Bitcoin to verify the transactions, it means that Bitcoin is a crucial part of how the public blockchain system works. Now, Bitcoin obviously is not the only one. There are many others and different governance. We talked about that. Um, but it's important to understand that it is about the token. It's not only about the technology. And some of the funds out there that are investing in blockchain technology companies and investing in the equity of the company, that's all fantastic. But the actual amazing, I think, outsized returns that we see in the tokens, you won't see there. So you really, if you want exposure to the sexy part <laughs> of the crypto space, you actually want exposure to the tokens themselves. Um, so what do we, uh, what, you know, not only for Bitcoin, but for, for all of these tokens, what do we look at? Well, we look at uh, both uh, fundamentals and technicals. That's very, very parallel to what we do in the uh, traditional finance place. It's just that the fundamentals look very different. Whereas um, as macro players, for example, we look at fundamentals in things like current account and fiscal deficits and debt and all that kind of stuff. When we are looking at crypto, we're looking at on-chain analytics, for example. And on-chain analytics, as you well know, will give you things like uh, developer activity or transaction volume or circular relating supply or things like that, that you can follow and it will inform you on what's the underlying uh, trends in the token itself. Um, you also have to look at technicals and uh, uh, or, or basically risk manage your book. People do it in different ways. Sometimes they just are protected with options, which are available now in some of the most liquid tokens. I like to use a, a quantitative filter to ball dampen uh, uh, our strategy or our portfolio. Um, there are different ways to do that, but you want to uh, you want to do that because uh, the volatility in the space is high, and you want to uh, you know risk manage that as optimally as possible to increase your sharp ratio. Um, so, but, uh, but in that, uh, that side of things, I think is uh, uh, the, the mindset is very similar to what we do in our traditional world, or you, we can use similar tools because at the end, what is it that we're doing? We're taking all this data in the case of crypto, all this on-chain analytics, but the trick is not, I mean, the data is there for everyone to see. A lot of it is actually free, by the way. Um, the question is, how do you think about it? How do you take all this data, aggregate it, put it in an algo that gives you uh, indi an indication of 
where these tokens are going to trade, where these tokens, you know, what's the potential for appreciation? Maybe there is a token that looks very sexy to you, but there is no developer activity in it. And therefore maybe, you know, it's waning out or the other way around. Um, and, and again, so you filter the tokens by uh, proper uh, uh, underlying protocol. Um, we filter the tokens by the on-chain analytics. Um, we look at event risks. We risk manage the portfolio. So basically what we are really doing is using our experience, applying it to the crypto space, using uh, our experience both in the technology and the macro to really make our best informed decision on where we think this is gonna uh, go next. Yeah, and and you know it's it's quite popular in the crypto world to come up with outlandish forecasts, you know, for Bitcoin and uh, the cryptocurrency. So people talk about okay, I saw on Twitter recently somebody said, "Oh, Bitcoin's going to go to six hundred fifty thousand, uh, you know, dollars." <laughs> and so you know, it's it's just started the, the big sort of rally. I mean, do, do well. Number one, do you think there's any value in those forecasts? And secondly, is there some way of understanding valuations in Bitcoin, or is that just not not worth worth kind of doing? In <clears throat> oh, yes, of course we we, we can, but um, we, we can think about it, and we do, and we look at different valuation models, and uh, um, and we try to to get a sense of where things could go, just to ballpark uh, the potential for growth. But it is very hard to do a, a forecast of price in this space. It's very nascent. There's still a lot of uncertainty, both on the regulatory side and uh, uh, you know, even on the technology side. Um, and there is really uh, uncertainty on how to value the tokens themselves. There's, there's more than one methodology. We look at more than one and try to uh, uh, um, and try to think about it that way. But as I say, each of these tokens is very different. So whereas I might care in some tokens on the uh, network effects of tokens for other tokens, that's actually not important at all because it's completely irrelevant on the use of the network. Or in the case of store of value tokens, maybe you can, I mean, a very, Bitcoin is an easy example, a very um, uh, popular exercise is to say, well, if we really think Bitcoin is digital scarcity or a version of digital gold. Um, what we want to look is demand and supply. We know what the supply is because that's fixed. And then we just want to uh, come up with a with a demand estimate. So you know, the very a very straightforward way to do that is you look at the gold market and you say, let's assume that say 30% of the market cap that is right now in the gold market is going to go to Bitcoin. And that's, I mean, but do I really know? Is it going to be 30%, 50%, 80% or 20%? I don't really know. I just know that right now it's like, you know, less than 1%. So um, I think, you know, so people say, okay, well, I think that can increase in time if people become comfortable with the technology, people become comfortable with the safety of the asset, uh, people know how to get involved uh, from an operational standpoint, et cetera. And then I can make that estimate, but it's still a guess. But say call it 30 percent well then you have an estimate of demand you take the net present value of that thing you divide it by the supply and you get a number and that's how people you know will come up with 300,000 or 600 or a million but the truth is that first of all um you could use bitcoin for other things than store value clearly i think that's a use case right now that makes most sense uh, but there's things like the lightning network and there's also ability to do uh layer two and, uh, and other smart contracts and bitcoin whether that's going to take off in the future or not i have no idea um but but there are things that could change in time um maybe uh maybe people decide that bitcoin is a much easier and uh, a liquid way to to hold their wealth and gold and so maybe the transition is not 30 but 80 percent or something so th those estimates are just highly uncertain and it's even more uncertain to time it you know in the middle of uh, of now we have we have big uncertainty on the fed um you know how aggressive is the fed going to be is inflation really going to uh, uh stay high here because of all the stimulus and so on or is it going to come down because for structural reasons there's huge uncertainty both on the macro side and the technology side so so really um uh, putting an, an exact number i think uh, i think it's not helpful um i think what is helpful is to uh, follow uh, uh very closely the fundamentals see how things are moving along really understand that it's still very nascent and under owned so the potential still for appreciation is, is quite high just because it's under owned across the world a lot of institutions are not yet involved although i can tell you 
a lot of them are very, very curious and very close to being ready to getting involved. So it suggests to me that the potential appreciation for appreciation is very much still there. I just can't properly time it nor price it exactly. Yeah, understood. And and you mentioned uh, layer two. Let, let's talk about some of the layer one. So Ethereum. Um, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on Ethereum, first of all, and then we can go into other so, ones. The, so, the, so the smart contract platforms have been incredibly exciting and they have been the source of a lot of innovation. Um, so many things are uh, are now, uh, Ethereum is used for so many things from, uh, I like to say the, the, the European Development Bank actually issuing on Ethereum um, to uh, uh, having, uh, um, uh, of course, all the uh, uh, DeFi's and the uh, metaverse and, you know, and all these uh, uh, other, you know, uh, use of play that we are, uh, that we're seeing across the board uh, because because of these smart contract platforms exist, the NFTs. I mean, I'm not talking here, sorry, not, not only about Ethereum, but the smart contract platforms, which Ethereum was the first one, and of course, the better known than the most popular um, uh, and, the, and the most used today. Uh, so, uh, uh, so I think uh, they add tons of value. Um, the issue with, uh, with these uh, uh, tokens is, of course, as the token appreciates, the cost of actually using the platform to execute your smart contracts goes higher and it gets more expensive. Um, now, so that means that that as it gets more expensive, there's room for competition of other tokens uh, that can bring a maybe cheaper and faster, better service. So it's hard to tell over time which of these uh, tokens are going to survive you know, in the long run. Um, but I think it's uh, that's why I think uh, a lot of them bring value in different ways. Um, and what we do is we build a diversified basket of these tokens and we rebalance this basket continuously by following their fundamentals and the on-chain analytics so that we're closely following uh, which baskets are becoming the winners and which ones are losing out. And we hope that as we do that continuously over time, we will eventually uh, 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 keep the, uh, the actual winners at the end uh, uh, of the game. But, uh, but, uh, but clearly, uh, they, are, they are very exciting propositions. There's so much yet that we, uh, for us to see in, in, in all the innovation and all the things that can come out of... Uh, of and, and, and so out of these smart contract coins, I mean, can you sort of say which ones at the moment you think look attractive, you know, which or... I, 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 would, I would hesitate to say that because what we have is we have an algorithm that ranks them and rebalances them daily. Uh, so okay. I actually, you know, so it, uh, so, I mean, there is some persistence. Uh, of course, but I would actually have to look at the algo of what it was saying this morning to tell you, um, you know, where we stand because they do, uh, they do rebalance, um, and uh, and so maybe something that was looking fantastic, uh, you know, two weeks ago is no longer in the top three or. <laughs> okay, so it's quite so, dynamic. I mean, I mean, what, what, yeah, yeah, what, I mean, one I, question, I you know, with these because we we have some passive indices that we built to sort of track some yeah. of the smart contract metaverse DeFi and so on. Um, uh, you know, one kind of question always is like, at what point do you include a coin in the universe that you should target? Yeah. You know, because you kind of see something small happening over there somewhere in the corner and it looks very interesting, but it's too small and then it grows rapidly. Yeah. I mean, what sort of criteria do you use to sort of say, look, this yeah, is, so, this should come so, onto our radar? So we have built a proprietary algo that we have back tested to uh, come up with, uh, uh, with a with really a quantitative indicator of when it makes sense to include it. So okay. we look at things, um, you know, when things start, you know, bubbling up, <laughs> we call it Solana in the, you know, fourth quarter of last yeah. year, you know, so it starts bubbling up, it starts appearing the algo, the algo doesn't immediately say, go in, you know, <laughs> like it just, you know, we follow it, we follow the on-chain, these things start popping up and then eventually um, it will rank in the top of our, uh, you know, of our rank. Uh, yeah. of a ranking matrix um, if the improvement is consistent enough in time and the uh, and so our our systems our algo will pick it up and we'll say okay um, this thing has legs it's been consistent it's been doing well for some time we can look at all these different on-chain analytics that tell us that uh, it, they're flagging in the right direction um, and uh, so you know it's, it's time for you to put an allocation. And as the token continues to improve in our ranking, the allocation gets bigger. And if it begins to deteriorate, it gets smaller. That's why it's dynamic. That's why yeah. 
Um, when I look at the, uh, you know, if you ask me for the ranking today, next week, it's going to look different than yeah, the following week. Yeah. There's going to be obviously some consistency because it's not like these things jump around so crazy and yeah. the algo has some smoothing uh, uh, features into it. So we're not like in and out, in and out all day, but it is actively managing. And I think that's the best way to go about it because these things change all the time. Just to give you a sense, the 75% of the top 20 coins today didn't exist three years ago. Yeah. So, so you can't really, uh, this um, uh, passive uh, top 10 allocation to the you know, top 10 by market cap uh, index, and we're just gonna you know, follow that to have a diversified portfolio. I don't think that's the smartest way to go about crypto right now. I think you have to be a lot more active because if you do a passive allocation like that, you miss all the exciting <laughs> new yeah. coins that begin bubbling up. And you also have to put in there some things that you actually may not like from a fundamental perspective. Yeah. So, um, so I think the best way is what we're doing. And in fact, when we do, um, uh, when we look, when we compare uh, um, backtest to a passive allocation, uh, we, you know, we do much better. Um, yeah, but yeah. that's not surprising. It's because it's a very nascent um, uh, ecosystem that is, you know, routinely uh, changing. So any strategy that that takes into account the uh, the very rapidly changing environment in these uh, space is, is going to outperform. And what do you think of market cap as an indicator? Because a lot of people go to CoinGecko or some of these websites and look at the top market cap and just say, okay, I'll just buy the yeah. top 10, top 20. That's what I'm saying. I mean, when we look, you know, our actively managed uh, um, portfolio does way better than a, than a passive by market cap allocation. Okay. And okay. the reason, like I say, that, you know, if you talking again about Solana, if you had a passive market cap allocation in, I'm going to guess around August uh, 2021, you missed the whole Solana rally. Yeah. You, you weren't even there because Solana was not, you know, in the top 10. Or, um, you know, you maybe, maybe you are caught uh, for longer than you would like in some of the meme coins, um, right? Yeah. In some of the Dogecoin or like things like that, which, you know, you may, if you are brave enough, we want to like, you know, try to, you know, catch that rally or not, but maybe from a fundamental perspective, you don't really want to be there. And when, when it starts coming down and you're passive, that thing is still in your top 10. So you're catching all the way, the thing all the way down. So I don't think it's the, the smartest way to go about it in crypto. I think an actively managed um, a strategy makes most sense in this environment. Maybe five years from now, um, you know, it, it will be. I'm gonna say something different. Uh, hopefully not, because I, I think I do think we add value uh, uh, regardless. But um, but certainly right now, I think it's uh, it's a pretty obvious proposition that you don't want to go passive. Yeah, and you've mentioned on-chain analytics a few times. I mean, are there certain indicators that you you think are useful? You know, like we look at on-chain analytics as well. So there's like hodler yeah. behavior. There's all, all of these other sorts of things, different sort of price metrics you can use and um, developer activity yeah. and things like. What, what yeah. types of things do you think? Yeah, I think all of those are are, are worth uh, watching. I think uh, uh, the more information, the better. The trick is how do you aggregate the information and yeah. how do you rank the different uh, the, the different indicators because you're going to have ten. 20 different indicators and how do you know which ones are more relevant and, and which ones are not so so that's where well obviously uh, uh, you know a, a trained experienced background comes into play and all the back tests and all that but I would just say that from perhaps because of my background and as an economist and a more fundamental take on things I think at the end of the day demand and supply are key yeah. And so you can look at sentiment, you can look at Reddit subscribers, <laughs> so you can look at, you know, a, a huddle activity, you can look at uh, how much flow comes in and out of exchanges. But at the end of the day, demand and supply are king. And that's important. I'm saying demand and supply, because for a lot of the very tech oriented players in the space, they normally look at the use of play and they think demand is, you know, everything but supply is very important for price and uh, and so you have to look at uh, at, at both um yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, i think people for sometimes there's some new coin you know 
I don't know, Filecoin, great for storage, fantastic. You know, so let's, you know, let's, the demand is going to be great. Let's all go in and like, okay, great. But look at the governance, look at the protocol, look at supply, you know, look at all these other things. Just as we were doing serious analysis in our traditional markets, we have to bring that degree of serious analysis to the crypto space. Let's look at all of it. Not only the use of play, the promise of the future, the demand, it's, What's the demand? What's the supply? What's the center? What are the technicals? You have to just put it all together to really have a, 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 an optimally managed book. Yep, yep, understood. And, you know, you, you, we touched on DeFi earlier in relation to Ethereum. Just, just a really sort of basic question here is, where do the yields come from exactly in DeFi? You know, because, yeah. you know, number one, you know, th these are new technologies, yet they offer a yield. Often the yields are incredibly high, like a thousand percent or something like that. Like, <laughs> how can these tokens offer a yield? I mean, they're not a central bank or there's not, they're not linked to a, a yield curve. Yeah. So no. where does that come from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a great question because um, a lot of people think of yield farming as, you know, just interest rates. And then they say, well, my interest rates in my bank are less than 1%. And, you know, yeah. and these things are offering, you know, multiple digit percent, you know, in some cases, and how do I think about that? So what is important to understand is yield farming is, is not your typical traditional finance interest rate, really. Um, there's a lot of things that uh, uh, where those uh, interest uh, income come from. Um, what, some of it is actually lending. Um, some of these DeFi uh, platforms actually do lend crypto assets to players that need them for various reasons. Um, some of that lending is actually riskier because you even have a new uh, protocol that came out recently that has uncollateralized lending, for example. So then you have uh, higher rates just from the lending side of things. But it's not only lending, you also could have staking. So on the proof of stake consensus mechanism, you can actually stake your tokens to validate transactions and get rewarded for doing that. So that is a different uh, uh, way to gaining yield. You could also gain yield from um, doing uh, 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 basis trades between uh, futures and spot, for example, that has decreased in time, but that's also another source of yield. And also, for example, you could uh, get yield from selling ball from uh, uh, crypto options. And as we know, the vol in crypto is very, very high. And actually the uh, implicit vol in the crypto options market is even higher. So if you want to take the risk, of course, and, uh, and earn some yield by selling vol, then you could earn a lot more. Now, of course, um, higher yield, higher risk. So you need to know what is behind the yield you're getting. Um, I would caution against the, you know, 100% yield type products, but of course, you know, it's, it's about risk taking. So um, if you're willing to take the risk, you, you know, you can play in that market. Uh, that's, we don't do that. Um, but there are uh, in some of these more uh, cautious and serious um, uh, 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 yield sources, uh, uh, lending uh, activities, you can actually get attractive yields uh, in a much uh, safer way. And, uh, and what, what about the... That it's diverse, sorry. Yeah, I, I was going to ask, you know, the stable coin yields, um, you know, uh, are much higher than zero, you know, and so... In your yeah. view, what's what's the risk that you you have with that? Because that's quite appealing. You know, you're you're pegged to the yes. dollar. Often, um, depending on which stablecoin you're looking at, but let's say you you pick a very credible one, audited, backed by Treasuries, then you know you still get a pickup of like three, four, five percent. Yeah, but, but remember, the there's uh, you know the, 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 these things are risky, right? I mean, the uh, these things are in theory credible ones, but at the end of the day, they are pegs, right? We are pegging uh, yeah. uh, our, our stable coin to, uh, <laughs> to what um, we have to uh, believe that our uh, fully backed uh, reserves in the fiat currency of choice uh, for these coins. And, uh, and you know, we as, uh, as, as FX professionals in emerging markets know <laughs> that sometimes pegs break and sometimes uh, there is risk in what they're telling us that the reserves are. So there is some due diligence to do there. That said, I actually do think that's one of the safest way to go about it. Uh, there are uh, some stable coins that have been questioned on their actual ability to maintain the peg. 
but there are others that look a lot safer and well managed and so you just want to do the proper due diligence and and look at each of them and pick the ones that you think are safest within that uh space um and but you also have to always know that you're taking you know you're taking risk when you are uh when you are involved this is not the same to get you know some percent interest in your checking account in a traditional bank who is uh fdic insured <laughs> than if you are uh, getting some yield in uh in, in a crypto space, even if it's a stable coin. It's much better, again, than the 100% yield in some volatile uh, you know, token that nobody has ever heard of. <laughs> but, uh, but there's still there's still more risk, obviously, than, than, uh, than, than in our traditional world. Yeah, yeah. And then on the metaverse side, obviously, that's that, you know, that that's become a huge topic, you know, yes. not least because of Facebook's rebranding, you kind of accelerated it all and yes. we had this yes. massive volatility in Gala, like Gala recently has yes. done incredibly well. Um, you know, so you 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 kind of had the D, you, you kind of had the virtual world side, you have the game by side. I mean, how, how do you look at this, the the sort of the crypto metaverse space at the moment? So I I think the metaverse space has huge potential. Um, the, what happened is it was really uh, pretty much ignored for a while there. I mean, ignored in the grand scheme of things um, until of course, uh, Facebook did this uh, a great, um, uh, you know, PR campaign <laughs> by changing their, their name and then, you know, drawing attention to what is the metaverse. And I, I think like literally before Facebook made that, made that announcement, I, uh, I think a lot of people didn't even know the name metaverse or what it even right. meant or what it actually was. And so it just drew attention for everyone to look in into it and to see uh, what's in there and what the potential. I think it's in very, very early stages, but the potential is enormous. Um, you now have concerts on the metaverse. And of course, uh, this is something that COVID um, has accelerated um, the uh, 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 you know our, our online interaction with each other, um, and uh, and now you actually can go to a concert, and then you have when you are in the in your metaverse, perhaps in your concert, you're going to be represented by an avatar, and you want your avatar to actually look quite cool. So maybe you want to you know buy a Gucci bag for your avatar, and uh, you know and people actually pay for these things, um, and uh, and they're buying real estate in the metaverse, and so and so on. Is it going to look the way it's looking now? I don't think so. I mean, I think it's going to evolve. We don't really know uh, how or where it's going to go, but the potential is really is really big. And the fact that we are already having meetings, concerts, uh, activity, uh, art galleries, um, uh, showings in the in the metaverse, that just opens a, a huge amount of, uh, of potential um, that I think um, I think we can't ignore. Um, you know, instead of having to go physically to check out uh, an art show in uh, uh, in Miami, you actually go to the metaverse and and, and see it there, and then you can uh, through an NFT uh, purchase a percent of the uh, <laughs> of the art uh, item as opposed to having to purchase the whole thing. I mean, this is just opening a lot of possibilities. We don't know where it's going to end up, but I think it makes sense for everyone. Um, to diversify their portfolio uh, and allocate some. You know, at least, I don't know, call it 1%, 5% if you're a conservative investment in the crypto space, because all this potential, it's like, um, it's like an option. Yeah. Um, it, could, uh, it could just deliver enormous returns. And, um, and uh, if it's well-researched uh, and, and well-managed, I, uh, I think it's a, it's a good um, educated uh, risk. Uh, you don't want to get into the crypto space blindly because there is a lot of Ponzi schemes. There is a lot of fraud. There is a lot of risk. But I do think it's responsible to get into the crypto space in a responsible, well-managed, well-researched way. And and so if you are, you know, somebody who has like a traditional portfolio, you know, 60, 40 or some variation of that, I mean, how how should that person get exposed to crypto? Should they sort of allocate like 1% to a mix yeah, of crypto I mean, or, or how, how would you, you know? So, so uh, from, from what I've read so far, and of course these things, uh, uh, you know, change in time, but uh, but right now the portfolio construction exercises that, that we've looked at um, suggest that something around five to 10% 
10% on the very high end, I think 1% if you're very skeptical, so let's just call it 5% allocation to crypto, um, will significantly improve the sharp ratio of your portfolio. Um, because uh, you can, if you have Bitcoin, you if you look at, um, at Bitcoin alone, you know, in a, in not, not just the last year, but say the last five, you know, eight years or whatever you want to, you know, look at, um, the correlation is low. Um, and the return is high and the, say the sharp of Bitcoin for the last five years or so is around two. Um, now, if you have like, we are constructing a diversified basket of crypto tokens, it makes it even better because our beta to the S&P is much lower, it's around 0.3 and our beta to uh, Bitcoin is like 0.4 because we have a basket of diversified tokens. And so if you have outsized returns, um, lower vol and lower beta, that just uh, enhances the uh, the return and the sharp ratio of your, of your portfolio. So I think um, an allocation of 5% I mean, you don't have to take my word. It's not only me that has done this exercise. There's there's a lot of exercise, including from some of the you know fidelity of these worlds and so on, um, where you can see that that there is a, a significant improvement in the uh, a sharp of your portfolio from adding exposure to crypto around that size. And and just to round off our discussion on crypto, what's it been like setting up a crypto fund? Um, well, it's, it's actually a lot of fun. It's very different uh, uh, than a traditional fund, I believe, in the sense that everything is uh, through APIs, um, everything is uh, um, uh, automated. Um, uh, the middle office connects through an API to the administrator who connects to the API to the bank who connects to the API to the custodian and everybody's like double checking each other and triple checking and you know and, and it's actually quite seamless and fun and um, my fund now has uh, employees uh, all over the place um, our middle office is in Europe um, I have one of our quant analysts is in Mexico um, a developer is in Boston uh, uh, the uh, CFO and myself are in the New York Connecticut area, um, and uh, and it all works uh, fantastic. <laughs> uh, so it's uh, it, it's actually um, uh, it, the world really since COVID has changed so much, and the crypto world, of course, has been ahead of all of us. Uh, so uh, so so I think uh, I think that's been uh, quite an experience. It's been it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, that sounds great. Now I did want to round off with a few personal questions that I ask all my guests. Sure. The first one was, what's the best investment advice that you've ever received from anyone? <laughs> well, actually, I mentioned a little bit of that earlier on, which is timing is the most important uh, okay. element. I think timing is 50% of your trade. Uh, you can be right and you can lose money because you get the timing wrong. So I think it's very important, especially for those of us that come from a more fundamental background, um, as opposed to a trading background where perhaps some, you know, they're all very uh, aware of that. Um, but for me, I had to learn that it's not enough to get the analysis right. I really have to uh, trade it uh, accordingly uh, uh, to its proper uh, technicals and proper timing. I have to take that into account to be successful. Um, so okay. I, I would that's say great. that that's number one. There's, there's many any more things that are important, but uh, I think that's number one. I've, I've yeah. learned that lesson the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the other question I had was, um, do you have any tips on productivity or, you know, I know oh. you, you're, man you're doing so much stuff right now and you probably have <laughs> historically. I mean, do, do you have any system to kind of cope you know, with everything? I, I don't think I have a, a good system. I actually don't think I'm the most productive person uh, <laughs> uh, in the world either. I think there are a lot of people that are more productive than I am. I think um, I stick to the idea of um, working smart is uh, more important than working hard. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. what I try to do is I try to focus on, okay, what's important now? Um, and in fact, actually, that's a little bit of what you have to do when you trade because you have so much information, so much data and podcasts and articles and opinions. And so you have to think, how do I summarize this to pay attention and to work on what's important? So you have to properly prioritize and, and just concentrate instead of in developing skills to do a lot more for a lot more time to actually say, how can I prioritize things and just focus on what's important and get the biggest bang for my buck? <laughs> okay, yeah, no, understood. That makes a lot of sense. And, and, and kind of the last question I wanted to ask you was, um, are, are there any books that really influenced you over your career? Oh. Yes, I actually, um, I'm big on um, 
behavioral stuff. Okay. Um, I think that the human mind is fascinating and how we make decisions, uh, I think is crucial. And coming uh, from a, a traditional PhD in economics background where we are uh, looking at you know, rational agents, um, reading the book of Dan Ariely, Predictably Rational, I felt was uh, fantastic. Um, of course, there is uh, Thinking Fast, uh, Thinking Slow by uh, uh, Kahneman. Um, these I think are two very, very important books um, in the approach the subject in different ways. But the title of Ariely, I think, is brilliant because not only we human beings are irrational, we are predictably irrational. <laughs> so we are irrational and we can predict how so. And that's likely because we are wired in a certain way for, um, in my view, evolutionary per uh, reasons. Um, I, I, you know, Parallel to this, I really like um, uh, evolutionary psychology. So how our pre-wiring affects our behavior, um, and there are you know tons of books on uh, on that side of things that uh, that uh, that I also that I also enjoy. Um, uh, Sapolsky's books and uh, um, the Red Queen from Matt Ridley. Um, all these things I think are fascinating. But in terms of uh, our, of our field of economics and finance, um, being aware of these biases, I think, um, I think is important, both for uh, our competitors, but also uh, most importantly for ourselves. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and if people wanted to, um, you know, follow you in some way or just reach out to you or, or understand what you're doing, is there a way for them to follow you? I think or? the easiest at this time is to uh, reach me through LinkedIn. Okay. Um, I, yep. uh, you know, you can just search me. It's uh, I'm there, and, um, and I'll include uh, a link uh, to your LinkedIn uh, profile on the on perfect. the account. Yeah. Perfect. So yeah, just with that, thanks a lot. It's it great speaking to you. you. I learned a lot, and uh, yeah, you. good luck with the fund. Thank you very much. I hope to do this again sometime. I enjoyed this. Great.